Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, so for presenting our capstone project. Um, yeah, I guess before we get started, um, we're going to introduce ourselves. So um, I, my name's Ian, um, Ian Duran. I'm an uh, engineer by training, um, but I'm just uh, finishing up a, a master's in uh, data science at the University of Virginia. Uh, I currently work for Pratt & Whitney uh, here in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, I'm currently working as a software development uh, program manager, but um, so up until recently in my career, I did a lot of mechanical engineering, uh, materials engineering, uh, working mostly on research and development for um, hot gas cap gas path parts for gas turbines. So, um, I guess, uh, Lauren, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I am Lauren O'Donnell. Um, like Ian, I've just graduated from the University of Virginia for, with the Master's in Data Science. I'm located in Blacksburg, Virginia, and I currently work doing um, project management, service level management, and data analytics for an IT company called 1901 Group. Um, my original background was actually in psychology and music, um, so I, I'm taking a pivot um, recently. And yeah, that's a little bit about me. I'll go ahead and toss this over to OC. Hey guys, I'm OC. I was a machine learning engineer at FNBO uh, Bank in Omaha, Nebraska. I have now moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin. I'm a caretaker and I'm now also a data scientist. So that'll be fun. Thanks, OC. Um, and I also wanted to mention, so uh, Catherine M was also part of our team. Uh, she unfortunately can't be here tonight uh, due to travel, um, but she's a senior technical writer for Scale AI. Uh, based in Northern Virginia. Um, so she recently graduated with us, but prior to that, uh, she had gotten her bachelor's in computer science also from uh, UVA. Um, I also wanted to mention that Catherine was kind of our resident GIS expert uh, for this project, or if she became that during the project. So uh, we'll do our best to answer any um, technical GIS related questions, um, but uh, unfortunately she can't be here with us. So. All right, um, I guess uh, with that, let me get started. Uh, so that was the team. And I did wanna give just a quick um, brief overview of data science in case anybody on the call isn't um, super familiar with that discipline. Um, so I thought this was a pretty good uh, statement that describes data science. Um, it's a field that brings together uh, a bunch of different disciplines, but it focuses primarily on like advanced statistics, uh, as well as computer science, and it um, and it enables us to gain uh, new insights from data uh, using software as well as uh, advanced uh, statistical tools. And this could be anything from like um, predictive models or like generative and uh, AI, which you're probably familiar with from like ChatGPT or DALI. Um, so models that are trained off of uh, really large uh, bodies of data. Uh, and then, so at the University of Virginia, so with the data science master's program, we focus primarily on developing those uh, fundamental skills. So uh, really heavy into statistics. Um, we do a lot of programming, mostly in languages like um, Python and R, um, but we also hit on kind of broader computer science topics, stuff like that. And then we try to put all of that together. So the statistics, the programming, as well as um, hopefully some sort of uh, like topical expertise to try to you know, gain new insights into uh, data or utilizing data. Um, so um, another, another aspect of it is also like a machine learning and natural language processing, which you'll see we did leverage some of those uh, technologies within this program. And that's also like one of the hallmarks of uh, data science. Uh, all right, so a quick overview of the project and kind of the intent of the project. So what we were trying to do. So um, as you probably know, like one of the many uses for uh, OSM data is for disaster uh, response. And um, within the OSM data set, there are numerous gaps uh, in different areas that are going to be more or less uh, mapped within the environment. And the request from OSM US was to see if we could try to develop a tool that would uh, help to enable, I guess, first identifying those areas within OSM data. So, so looking at the map, like how much of it, how, like how would we judge whether or not an area is 
um, well mapped without having to like go in and look at all of the features individually, right? Um, but then also we wanted to try to marry that with some sort of risk data. So we wanted to try to identify proactively areas that are both poorly mapped within OSM, but then also at high risk of impact from natural disasters. Uh, so we decided to try to look at this from a county level, uh, not too granular, but also not too high level. And we also um, ended up focusing on building footprints within OSM primarily. Um, we felt like that was an important feature for disaster response, but it also tended to be something that was um, that we found to be relatively uh, undermapped. Unlike, you know, like roads, if you look at the U.S., roads tend to be pretty well mapped almost um, everywhere you look uh, within OSM. Um, buildings were an exception to that. And then um, we also looked at point of, points of interest, which um, we'll talk about a little bit later, but they tended to be more inconsistent and maybe not. We didn't think that they were great metrics or great for use as a metric for um, determining the mapped condition. So, but the goal of the project was to basically to deliver a tool that could be utilized by anybody who was interested in let's say identifying potentially undermapped areas that then could be, uh, that then are likely to be impacted by a natural disaster and using that information um, ideally for like task planning. Uh, all right, so um, so on this slide, uh, so I took this uh, image actually from a previous Mappy Hour presentation back in 2021, but I thought it was a great uh, visual visualization of like, of how OSM can respond to a, a natural disaster. Um, so you can see there on the left, this is um, a map of Port-au-Prince uh, in OSM prior to the earthquake uh, that occurred in Haiti back in 2010. And then shortly after that, <laughs> like in less than a month, um, the OSM data set by you know, volunteers has been significantly built out, right? So now we have incorporated missing roads, missing structures. Um, and while this is an amazing like, ability of the OSM community to be able to be, uh, you know, reactive and provide this information that can then be used by emergency responders, um, you know, what we were trying to solve is how do we try to identify these areas prior to a disaster, right? And so one thing that's maybe a little unique about uh, Port-au-Prince was its level of undermapping. So uh, anybody looking at Port-au-Prince um, prior to that disaster in OSM could probably easily have identified it as being undermapped, but there are large portions of the U.S. where it's not quite that obvious, right? So um, at the uh, start of the program, we had uh, a couple different resources for evaluating risk, um, but there wasn't really a consistent or universal tool for evaluating, say, how well an area was mapped within the OSM database. Uh, so here in this slide, so you can see um, the map to the left is solely based on the National Risk Index. And uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, hurricane risk. Um, so uh, so you can see, like, I guess, so outside of the fact that um, clearly Los Angeles needs to be updated in terms of hurricane risk, but otherwise, this is like a pretty well-established federal um set of data that can provide a, a wide range of risks and values for all sorts of different natural natural disasters uh, throughout the entire country. Um, and it was also it also can be provided uh, at the county level. Um, so so the risk data already existed, but our goal was to marry it with the OSM data. And in this case, really like determining the level of undermapped for all of these uh, risk areas and tying that to an actual ground truth was a real um, uh, challenge within uh, the OSM database. Like, how do you prove that something doesn't exist uh, within the database? Um, all right. So uh, I think so Lauren is going to speak now about some of the um, data sources that we used uh, and the risk metrics that we relied on for uh, the undermapped areas. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Mm -hmm. um, so the data sources for our capstone were pulled primarily from four different sources. I'll do a brief overview here on this slide, and I'll do a deeper dive into some of those sources and the, the following ones. So the first source is introduced by Ian and that you all know very well was OpenStreetMap. Um, the OSM data is geographic information source, just data, pulled from OSM's Overpass API and formatted in XML. The data are semi-structured to include a wide variety of geographic features. 
Um, our second data source was the Microsoft Maps Deep Learning Model Project called Building Footprints. This is part of Microsoft Search Assistance and Intelligence MSAI project that Microsoft has, and it explores deep learning techniques to innovate products that are used by millions. And I'll go more in detail on MSAI here in the next slide. To incorporate risk of natural disasters in our model and deliverable, we utilize the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA's National Risk, risk Index, or NRI. The NRI was generated as a risk assessment tool and interactive dashboard. It contains data for every census tract in the US, including county level, and includes risk data on 18 natural hazards. The risk values were calculated by FEMA and their partners using three variables expected annual loss, social vulnerability, and community resilience. Like the OSM and MSAI data, the NRI is available freely for use and download. The final data set was the US Census boundaries. This data set contains cartographic boundaries at several resolutions. We use the most detailed resolution, one to 500,000 for the 3,143 counties in the US as of 2020. Next slide. The MSAI Building Footprints Project is a deep learning model started in 2018 by Microsoft to identify structures from satellite imagery. With some imagery collected in 2019 and 2020, and the remaining with an average source year of 2012, so a little bit on the older side, and we'll touch on that later. The initial goal of this project was to increase the coverage of building footprint data available for open data, actually for OpenStreetMap for humanitarian efforts. This project was implemented in the United States, Canada, South, Af South America, Uganda, Tanzania, Nigeria, Kenya, and Australia. The data set used in our project consisted of 130 million computer generated building footprints in the US provided by Bing. These footprints were polygonized by the algorithm constructed by Microsoft called the Open Source CNTK Unified Toolkit and applied alongside the ResNet 34 with RefineNet upsampling layers. The data from all completed count, uh, countries um, is actually available on GitHub for download and use. And based on the completedness of the US data set, um, it became our baseline of comparison for the OSM data, which we'll cover in a little bit. Next slide. So why disaster resiliency? To understand why we're focusing on disaster resiliency, we have to kind of first understand the difference between disaster resiliency and disaster recovery. Um, so disaster recovery, something went wrong here. Um, disaster recovery, as defined by the U.S. Department of the Interior, is the process of restoring, redeveloping, and revitalizing communities impacted by disaster. These efforts often begin alongside disaster and continue after the disaster event itself. Disaster resilience, as defined by the United Nations, is the ability of a system, community, or society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate, and to recover from the effect of a hazard in a timely and efficient manner, including through prevention and restoration of its essential basic structures and functions. So in other words, disaster resilience incorporates disaster recovery efforts alongside prep, uh, the preparation prior to an event. So it's the ability of a specific locality to bounce back and includes the preparedness of, the of that locality as well. So since 2010, OSM has been used by disaster responders for resiliency efforts. And it's been primarily led by the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team called HOT for short. The HOT team identified during several disasters as Ian had mentioned before that there are some areas that really lacked mapping um, during disasters. And a lot of the mappers immediately after those um, disasters would go out to those locations and the volunteers would update the map. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those disaster responders need that information prior to responding to that locality. So based on these efforts, it became clear how mapping would be beneficial. And this led OSMUS to seek different ways to identify at-risk areas of disaster alongside undermapped localities to increase mapping efforts. Next slide. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, was the most logical place for us to turn for risk information. 
FEMA, along with partners in academia, local, state, and federal governments, and private industry, created the National Risk Index, or NRI, in 2017. The NRI provides a visual tool and data source that is publicly available for download and use. It, contain, it contains an overall risk index value and a separate risk value for 18 natural disasters, as identified by FEMA, for each U.S. county and census tract. Next slide. And here, all of the 18 natural hazards, as identified by FEMA, are listed. Uh, we have bolded some of the risks that disaster partners um, have identified as top priorities. Um, and those were the initial focus of our project. Um, below, you'll also see the risk index value as calculated by FEMA, um, which is the expected annual loss times the social vulnerability divided by community resilience. And now I'll pass this back over to Ian to cover our methods. Thank you, Lauren. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna take a little bit of a step back and go over some of the initial approaches, like how we arrived at um, utilizing some of the data sets that Lauren just described. Um, so first we tried to take uh, more of a predictive modeling approach and here like our initial idea was actually to see whether or not we could use the features um, within OSM uh, like themselves to try to predict um, whether or not an area was uh, under mapped. So again, going back to the idea of um, can we can we prove that something doesn't exist using features um, within the landscape that we can observe? Um, and so the approach that we took was to try to compare uh, historical data uh, from OSM to data right after a um, uh, like a, a hurricane event. So we started with hurricanes um, and we quickly found that this was a very challenging approach. Um, it's it we had uh, some issues associated with um, trying to uh, work with the historical OSM data. Um, and I, I think maybe I mentioned this before, but this is probably a good time to mention again that uh, starting this project, none of us had any background whatsoever in GIS. So there was um, a bit of a learning curve on our side, both on the uh, in terms of GIS, but also as well as just like um, dealing with OSM data. So OSM data in its XML format is um, you know requires special tools. So there are a lot of um, wonderful Python libraries uh, designed to work with this data, and we worked primarily in GeoPandas and utilizing OSM and X. Um, but we found it we found it very challenging to try to work with historical data. And then even once we had the historical data, so working with a small data set, uh, we found it very difficult to build a model that really had any uh, predictive results, right? So um, correlating between uh, the pre and post uh, disaster landscape really, uh, we didn't. We really didn't have any success with that. But that was our first approach. So then we tried switching gears and tried to <clears throat> tried to find a, like a different way to approach it. So we looked at po points of interest, and we were thinking that looking at points of interest or smaller um, data sets might allow us to leverage uh, APIs, so, so like Google Places, to try to identify uh, trends within Google Places and say, okay, if these um, points of interest or features exist within Google Places then perhaps um, perhaps we can compare that to the OSM data and again, try to come up with some kind of mapped statistic. But so um, we quickly ran into challenges associated with dealing with the Google API. We struggled to get the volume and um, quality of data that we needed uh, to be able to draw any kind of real conclusions. So um, after a bunch of work, with uh, the Google API, we finally decided to try a different approach, which was to try to create a more sophisticated model. Uh, we wanted to create something that was able to take satellite imagery and identify the features within the satellite image. And then once those features have been identified, so you know things like roads, buildings, and other structures, that we could compare that back to the OSM uh, database. So it was in the process of doing research about how to create such a model, how to find the volumes of, um, of image data that we would need that we ended up stumbling across uh, the Microsoft um, data set that Lauren just talked about, right? And so this Microsoft data set already included the, the 
um, the, the kind of ground truth data that we have been looking for um, uh, already in a format that we could easily import and utilize with um, with the OSM data, right? So, um, so as Lauren had mentioned, you know, Microsoft had a whole team of data scientists working on this. Um, so we were, we, we probably could have gotten some portion of that type of uh, model completed by the end of the semester, but being able to leverage that work that already existed uh, enabled us to make a lot more progress much more quickly. So, um, uh, so let's see. All right. So, um, they also made this um, data, as she mentioned, widely av available. I think, I, I don't know if anybody here is familiar with it, but there is already a tool that utilizes um, this data, which is the um, the RAPID 2.0, um, and uh, that can be used with OSM. It'll overlay that AI-generated data um, to support mapping efforts. So what we're doing is trying to leverage this in what we think is kind of a new and novel way. So. Um, so what we did is we, this is, this slide kind of takes us through the methodology. It was basically, we, um, we looked, we focused on buildings and we tried to break it down by county level so that we would query the OSM API, we would pull in the um, building information, and then we would compare it directly to the Microsoft generated data. And we were able to do this. We basically just calculated the area of structures within the county from the, um, Microsoft and AI generated data, and then like compared that against um, what existed in OSM, and that would uh, essentially give us a percentage of the area that is mapped. Right? Um, there are some limitations to this approach. Uh, I think Lauren also mentioned that the age of the satellite imagery used by Microsoft is is pretty wide. So there are some swaths of the country, um, and they have maps of the of some of the age of the data on their GitHub site, but some of the uh, maps uh, go back to 2012. So we could find that if we generated this statistic using Microsoft data that was per particularly old, um, we sometimes would end up with um, with actually a negative statistic, which was an indication that um, there would there were actually really well mapped areas in OSM where the Microsoft data for whatever reason hadn't caught up with OSM, and this was uh, particularly the case in areas with um, with uh, like high growth uh, urban areas, um, places where there tend to be a lot of volunteers for mapping efforts. Um, but either way, so for the purpose of this project, we, we still felt like this was the best ground truth because it was um, based on satellite imagery. And we felt like, although it wasn't perfect, we could definitely see trends within um, the US geographically uh, in terms of areas that were more or less mapped um, some of the things that kind of jumped out was, you know, like a rural versus urban uh, divide, right? So the um, urban areas tend to be much, much more well mapped, um, which, you know, makes sense. And then uh, you can get out into um, much less populated areas in the U.S. and, you know, you would see, um, you know, a much poorer rate of mapping. Um, so then we took that under math statistic and we basically weighted it using the risk statistic that came directly out of the national risk index. So um, what we what we did is created a tool which allows you to visualize the um, the you can you can basically use a sliding scale to weight uh, that statistic and then visualize it on a map so that you can see um, you can go basically from visualizing only the undermapped areas to visualizing only the risk areas. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like uh, in just a moment. Um, so, but before we get to that, so we did do some validation work. Uh, so here's an example of, um, of a comparison of two data sets. So uh, OSM is on the left, uh, MSAI is on the right. And here you can see, uh, you know, there's, there's, quite a lot of um, air, uh, buildings that have been mapped in Microsoft, which don't show up in OSM. And in this case, uh, the statistic generally agreed with um, with what we saw visually. So we took a sample, a random sample, we chose a, um, a wide range of counties all throughout the US. And then we did, we focused mostly on, you know, small towns or population centers, just so that we could, um, you know, areas that had a reasonable number of, of buildings. 
And then we would go in and um, just verify, like, is that undermap statistic performing as expected? So this is a good example where our undermap statistic gave us a very, very low, you know, there are numerous regions of um, rural America where you would say maybe three to 5% of structures have been mapped. And so this would be an example of, um, of one of those. Then on the other end of the spectrum, so this is um, an example where you see OSM and the MSAI actually agree really well. So there are very few structures that show up as, um, as unmapped in, um, in OSM. So uh, in this specific case, we uh, this agreed fairly well with our um, mapped statistic indicating that um, that both data sets uh, generally agree with each other. Um, and it's not to say so we did also have uh, some inconsistent uh, um, examples of generating that statistic. And like this was an example where for some reason, uh, we actually had, um, a generally well, or a, like a good statistic in terms of how mapped it was. But when we actually dug into it and looked at it, you can see there's this very large development that uh, is unmapped in OSM, but um, shows up in the Microsoft data. So um, we weren't able to, so that's like, that's something for future work. Um, I think OC will touch upon that, but we, uh, we, we didn't have the time to track down all of the uh, I guess, nuances of how well the statistic did or did not work. We had to look at it at a pretty high level um, and, um, you know, look for general trends. So next, this is uh, an example of the dashboard that we came up with and how it would work. So uh, we created it in Python and uh, using Dash, and it allows you to... Um, to select the natural disaster up at the top. Uh, this is one of the, as Lauren mentioned, the 18 natural disasters that are available. And then you can change the desired ratio of how much do you want to visualize the undermap statistic versus how much do you want to visualize the risk. And so as you go through, you'll see um, you're, you're basically kind of slowly fading from one statistic to the other. And the idea here was that uh, depending on the risk and depending on how well um, the areas are mapped, there may be a ratio here that may be more helpful than um, than something else, depending on who's trying to do the analysis. Uh, so we we gave this ability to kind of go through until you get all the way. So this is basically just the that same risk map that we uh, looked at at the previous slide, uh, visualizing just all of the hurricane data. Um, but you can go through and you can do this for any of the uh, uh, given risk categories. And now I'm going to hand it over to OC to discuss some of the other challenges. Thanks, Ian. So <laughs> I wanted to talk more about the in-depth trials and challenges while working on this project. Things we learned and things that just didn't go well and what we might expect for newer iterations of this project. So challenges. While working on this project, we had a good amount of hurdles we needed to hop over. Firstly, as Ian said earlier, we needed to learn how GIS data actually works. Throughout our degree, we really never had to touch geographical data. So this would be our first attempt at actually using it, let alone not having the nice clean data that schools would normally provide to learning data scientists. One of the main challenges with GIS data presented involved deconflicting the various projections of each database. We learned pretty quickly that data uses a certain coordinate reference system, or CRS, which is influenced by numerous factors. An example of this is how the data is translated from the three-dimensional Earth to a two-dimensional plane, or layers. Then that data is translated from the three-dimensional, oh, sorry, that is translated to different variables or features. This issue was critical when it comes to calculating geometrical polygons, which we used to create massive areas to filter data frames and help calculate the areas of buildings. To help counteract this challenge, our code standardizes CRS for area calculations, translate the geographic CRS to an appropriate CRS for area calculations, then translate the CRS back once more. Learning all this took a large time investment at the start of the project, but we got through it. Next challenge we needed to conquer was baseline metrics. First part of this was finding something baseline or grounded truth that would help define what is mapped or undermapped. 
Doesn't sound too hard, right? Sadly, that was one of the most difficult challenges we had, just defining what is under map and over map is and figuring out a solution to capture mapping percentage took a long time. We went through numerous iterations and ultimately led to our final answer of the MSAI building footprints. Before talking about that, let's talk about the iterations that didn't work. Um, next slide. Cool. So we went through many approaches to trying to find something that worked, many of which failed. First approach we started was an indirect approach using proxy data to show a map statistic. We read this interesting paper by Barrington Lay about using roads to help generate a mapping statistic, but we came to a realization that this wouldn't work specifically in the United States. Because in the United States, the roads are already well mapped compared to buildings, especially even in rural areas. So we started looking into more APIs and geo other geospatial data points we can try and get a statistic out of that which landed us on the Google Places API since we hopefully found our base uh, and other geos we landed us on the Google Places API. Since we hopefully found our baseline through Google Places, we then shifted our approach towards points of interest or structures like the previous capstone group before us. But this approach had a large amount of issues. For example, with the fine places on Google Places, we were able to do a county level filtering, but could only return the top one result. Text search was more expensive, but that only returned 120 results and couldn't filter at a county level like what we wanted. So we're back to square one, trying to find some sort of baseline for comparison, which leads to our last approach, image analysis. Next slide. The final avenue of this investigation was direct analysis of satellite imagery to detect and quantify structures to find those that were missing from the OSM's database. There has already been extensive research into the use of convolutional neural networks, or CNNs for short, for building detection. So the first challenge on this endeavor was finding an open source of satellite imagery to run a CNN model on. And the second challenge was building or finding a suitable CNN model for overhead imagery. For this to work, the overhead imagery has to be clean enough to run a CNN to catch as many things as possible to create our baseline. Various parameters of overhead imagery like ground sampling distance, slant angle, type of sensors, cloud cover can make it difficult to gather enough training data for a model to perform well. While searching for a suitable selection of imagery, we discovered the MSAI project, which not only sourced imagery, but completed the CNN model and generated building footprints as well. The rapid OSM editing tool, which was originally developed by Facebook, integrates a base OSM map with additional tooling with data from Facebook Roads database and the Microsoft Buildings database. This was perfect for us. So MSI, MSAI database served as our baseline ground truth and we have no other issues whatsoever and it was smooth sailing, or at least we wish. With the MSAI data, we came across numerous issues, one being the vintage of the data, like Ian said earlier. If we look at the top image among the three images, um, excuse me, the orange spots replace places that were recalculated using newer imagery from 2019 and 2020 data. The rest were Bing imagery with an average year source of 2012. For areas with old enough imagery, the OSM database will have more up-to-date information than the MSAI data. For more rural, heavily under-mapped areas, the, the statistic is still fairly accurate. But for more urban areas with greater OSM contributor presence, the undermap statistic is inaccurate and sometimes negative, indicating more information in OSM than in the MSAI data set. Now looking at the bottom right image where MSAI is orange, OSM is blue, and the overlap is purple. We had issues with differences in geometrical shapes between MSAI polygons and the OSM polygons, where they were not always equal with each other. For example, courtyards on MSAI are one large polygon, while OSM might have polygons segmented. This level of detail can cause the MSAI to overinflate the area of building footprint. Another issue we did see, which I don't think I have on that image, is things that are inaccessible to OSM is accessible to the Microsoft um, data set because they can see it from above. And if it's like private property, we're probably not going to see that. And lastly, an issue we had with uh, we had was the Microsoft model had a recall of 94%, which to be fair is better than most other things we found like the road thing I talked about earlier, which only had about an 80%. Looking at the last image, if there are trees or other things in the way, buildings wouldn't be mapped shown as in the red circles where buildings should be mapped. But even with all the complications, we have still outputted some variable work. Next slide. Gorgeous, isn't it? Nothing's better than a nice visualization. And we are very proud of this. Um, I just want to show that off. Next slide. So for next possible steps, 
that can take this project even further would hopefully be something like automation, hopefully make our code something more people have access to. It would also be nice to automize the collection of things like data sets from the web, like the FEMA data that doesn't always update regularly. And most importantly, it would be nice if output could be more accessible and user-friendly. Right now our code outputs a nifty HTML that you can mess around with, but it would be nice if it was more readily accessible like on an app or something more usable. So next slide. So in conclusion, we have delivered something that is both intuitive and effective for use when it comes to determining undermapped areas with environmental hazards. A tool that can be updated for user specifics and is understandable to those who might not be code or data fluent. A tool that can output both tabular and visual metrics. And I think that is pretty great. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and thank you for listening. I think that's the next slide too, but thanks. <laughs>